quick short trip to Kisum. Let's see if we can learn a little bit of history about the culture and the people. And first things first, we have to explore a museum because where else are we going to get our information? Getting to Kisumu is fairly easy. You can either go by flight, which costs about $90 and it takes about 50 minutes, or you can enjoy a road trip with your friends, which takes about six hours and you can enjoy the scenic views on the way. So we landed just before sunset and the views were immaculate. I feel like this is one of the airports that has the most amazing sunset views. <laughs> to come and check out the museum just to see what it's about. Rightfully so, they don't allow any videography inside the museum, but they do allow photography. So I will take a few pictures of some pieces that I think are interesting, and then I'll just do like a little voiceover over the different pieces. Hopefully looking at some of the pictures and some of the information I'm going to give, you're going to feel a little enticed to want to come and see it for yourself but I feel like I wish I had more time to just explore more, but I only have a few hours, so this is, this is what we're getting. Our journey begins with the Luo people, the predominant ethnic group around Lake Victoria in Kenya. The Luo migrated to the region from South Sudan around the 15th century. They are the Nilotic people known for their rich oral traditions and vibrant culture. The Lua primarily relied on fishing, agriculture, and livestock keeping for their livelihoods. Their deep connection to Lake Victoria, which they call Nam Lolwe, has significantly influenced their way of life. Fishing is not just an economic activity, but a cultural cornerstone for the Lua, with many myths and legends centered around the lake. Fishing in Lake Victoria is essential. The lake is filled with various different species of fish. So there's the Nile perch, mbuta, tilapia, ngege, and sardines, omena. These three fish are the most sought after fish around Lake Victoria on the Kenyan side. Fishing techniques have been passed down through generations with traditional methods like using basket traps and nets still in place today. The fish not only provides food, but it's also a means of trade, linking the Luo to the other communities around the lake. Speaking of fish, something that you have to do when you come to Kisumu is eat some fresh fish around the lake. I unfortunately did not have enough time for that, but next time I'm definitely getting myself some fresh fish around the lake. Interestingly, the Nile perch wasn't always a part of Lake Victoria's ecosystem. It was introduced by the British colonials in the 1950s as part of an effort to boost the fishing industry. Initially, the introduction of this invasive species was met with resistance. The local people were wary of the Nile perch known as Mbuta in Luo. There were rumors and tales that the fish was poisonous and could cause rashes. Given the historical context and the mistrust for the British, it's understandable why the local communities were hesitant to embrace this new species. However, over time, the people began to eat the Nile perch and it has since become one of the most sought after fish from the lake. The Luo social structure is fascinating. They traditionally lived in homesteads known as Dala, which were composed of several huts for different family members. The head of the homestead was usually the eldest male known as Jaodala. The Luo people are also known for their intricate ceremonies and rituals, particularly those related to birth, marriage, and death. And dance play a crucial role in these ceremonies with instruments like the nyatiti and the urutu creating a unique sound that is integral to the low culture identity quick side note i was doing some research on different musical instruments within east africa i love collecting different african musical instruments and i went to habesha restaurant in nairobi and i noticed that they have 
the Nyatiti in the restaurant, but it actually is a similar instrument in Ethiopia and they call it the Kirare, which is so interesting that like two different um, ethnic groups from like completely far apart areas share the same musical instrument and they also play it in a similar way and it produces a similar sound. I just thought that was cool. I'm like, ah! The Nyatiti is a traditional Luo eight-stringed lyre and it holds a special place in their musical heritage. It's not just an instrument, but a storytelling tool used to pass down oral histories and traditions. Okay, again, quick side note. So like looking back at like African history, a lot of the times I feel like when you're trying to research about African history, like you only know it from the perspective of the colonials like you only know okay this is what the colonials photographed this is what they took this is what they wrote down and obviously because it's written by somebody else the history is only told from their perspective but if you try to dig deep into african history you'll find out that a lot of the way history was passed down was through generations and it was always passed down through storytelling and through music so i think perhaps there's always like that little split whereby it's like okay the people were passing down information through music and songs and like stories from like older generations to younger people and then the colonials came and of course that like changed everything and then now the stories that we know we only know what we can see as we as a current generation only know the stories or the visuals that we can see which is just like sometimes can be sad and dark history from like the colonials we only know what we can see from what they recorded with most of these images a lot of them are just made with ai i just had to keep like prompting like no people were in this no put these colors no do this and this so i spent a bit of time just trying to ai generate the images just trying to sort of make an image of what it could have been but the images of course are not accurate because there were no cameras in that time either so so Alongside the Nyatiti, there's this instrument called the Urutu, which is a one-stringed fiddle, and various drums are also central in the Luo music. These instruments together create a rich tapestry of sound that bring their cultural stories to life. So, while the Luo are the most prominent group, they're not the only group of people that have historically lived around Lake Victoria. The region is home to various Bantu-speaking tribes, including the Luya, Kisi and the Kuria. These groups migrated to the area over different periods of time and have coexisted with the Luo people for centuries. The Bantu speaking communities are primarily agriculturists, cultivating crops like millet, sorghum, and maize. But Quick side note, I'm sorry, I have lots of side notes. If you do a lot of research into Ugali, which people think is originally Kenyan or East African, it actually isn't. Ugali was introduced into Africa by the colonials, so it's not inherently an African meal in its different forms and shapes in different countries, but it was introduced by the colonials during their reign. So back to it their presence of you know the bantu speaking languages has contributed to the diverse cultural landscape of the region with each group bringing its own language customs and traditions and in time if you look at you know there's a lot of similarities between um a lot of the tribes that are in western kenya they've you know intermingled a little bit here and there and like culture and music tradition it's all it's all mixed to a certain extent Lake Victoria itself has been a vital resource for all the communities living around it. It wasn't originally called Lake Victoria, but that's just down a rabbit hole of colonialism, so we'll call it Lake Victoria for now. It is the largest lake in Africa and the second largest freshwater lake in the world. Kenya got the tiniest chunk of the lake, but you know, they make do with what they have. The lake has provided food, transportation, and for both water, domestic, and farming. So 
So what was amazing about this village within the museum was that it was a living museum. So the people there really tried to embody the culture and the traditions and the customs. Like they had everybody there. They had, um, you know, an elder man, a chief, and they had lots of wives. And it was like, you know, they really tried to embody everything. And they even put like all the storage places where people would put food. And even the shape of the way, the map of the way, um, the museum has been arranged is quite similar to what it was like um, several years ago and I thought it was pretty cool and then they also performed an amazing dance for us and sang some music and you know they let us get jiggy with it as well here's me pulling up the moves I was like oh gosh oh gosh keep up keep up I don't know this dance but I was doing it I got in the rhythm <laughs> Since Kenya gained its independence in 1963, Kisumu and the surrounding areas have continued to grow and develop. The city is now bustling urban center with a vibrant economy driven by trade and agriculture and tourism. Also just got to experience a dance which was a celebration of life the song means a celebration of life and it's really nice i think i practiced my moves i tried my moves so i would say the museum was quite small but there was just like a lot of information that you could like learn from it Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please let me know. If you want more historical videos with like historical context, kindly let me know. I personally love going to museums and just learning about history.